Welcome back, everybody. Today, we are going to move on and talk about eukaryotic organelles. That is, what do the structures inside of eukaryotic cells do? What are their jobs? What are their functions? So organelles, small organelles, are the individual pieces or compartments within a eukaryotic cell that perform specific function. Each structure, each organelle has a specific job to do or a specific contribution to uh, the cell overall to keep it alive and maintaining homeostasis. So we want to know what these different structures do and also how they work together to keep the cell in homeostasis. Now, there will be structures within your book, your textbook, that we do not talk about here in this presentation and that your assignment, because your assignment has you looking at a table and describing the structures and functions that won't be covered in your assignment. So if there are structures in your book that are not in this presentation and are not in the assignment, I'm not expecting you to know about them. Your book goes over more than is needed for the class and the AP exam. So let's focus on the ones in this presentation and the ones in your assignment mainly. So first is the nucleus, and it's the control center of the cell. Now, the nucleus or the nuclear membrane, which is like a phospholipid membrane around the nucleus, serves to protect the DNA because the DNA is the important instructions to build the proteins and do everything that the cells needs to do. And so we need to protect it. Within the nucleus, there is a specifically dense section called the nucleolus. And this is where ribosomes are made. We'll talk about what ribosomes do in a moment. and But you can see that nucleolus right here is that darker sphere in this artistic drawing. Inside the nucleus as well is the DNA stored in structures, long um, linear structures called chromosomes. Now, like we said, surrounding the nucleus is the nuclear membrane, a phospholipid membrane that controls those things that are able to move in and out of the nucleus. And it's really there to protect the DNA from damage and to control what can get inside to the DNA. Just like the nucleus has a membrane surrounding it, the cell has a membrane surrounding it composed of phospholipids. It separates the inside and the outside from the cell. And just like, excuse me, the nuclear membrane, it controls what can enter and what can leave the cell. So oxygen, carbon dioxide, food, water, nutrients, and waste. It also recognizes signals from other cells and has a big hand in communicating between the cells. We're going to talk much more next class about the structure and the function of the cell membrane. So I don't wanna to get too involved in that right now. Right now, we just need to main, make sure we understand the main function of the plasma membrane. We already mentioned that chromosomes exist inside the nucleus, but just to reiterate, they are the main structures were composed of DNA and proteins where uh, genetic information is stored. Uh, chromosomes are kind of called chromatin when they aren't condensed. So when the DNA is still long and stringy, like 90% of the time in the cell's life cycle, it's called chromatin. When the cell prepares to divide and that chromatin, that long stringy DNA, uh, gets more tightly packed, condenses what we call it, we then call them chromosomes. So chromatin and chromosomes refer to the same thing, DNA, just at different points and configurations during the life cycle of a cell. So since we're talking about proteins, 
Making a protein, as we saw in our last lecture video, is a huge part of what cells do. And that requires the coordination of many different cell organelles, the nucleus, the ribosomes, the endoplasmic reticulum, and the Golgi apparatus. So actually, I probably misplaced this slide. This probably should go later after we talk about these things. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about here... It's important that not only do we know or just memorize the functions of these different structures, but we are able to think about how they work together. That's why I really want to, I'll probably come back to this here in a couple of moments well, after we talk about uh, ribosomes and the ER and the Golgi apparatus. So we can talk about how they work together to keep the cell at homeostasis. We also talked about the nucleolus so far. This is where ribosomes are made within the nucleus. So here's the cell nucleus there on the outside. Uh, this is the um, uh, nuclear envelope. You see these little holes. These are called nuclear pores where really small things can get in and out of the nucleus. And this is the nucleolus, this region with a lot of activity, a lot of transcription occurring. This is where ribosomes are being made. Now, ribosomes are the protein factories. They are in the cytoplasm, and they read instructions about how to build proteins from DNA. Now, some ribosomes are what we call free ribosomes. They just exist floating around in uh, the, the cytoplasm, floating around in the cytoplasm, the liquid the material that fills the cell. And others are attached, we call them bound ribosomes, to the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, we're going to talk about the endoplasmic reticulum later. But to say right now, the ribosomes that are free ribosomes generally are in charge of making proteins that will be used inside of the cell. Ribosomes that are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum are usually responsible for making proteins that ultimately will be secreted from the cell, either used as part of the cell membrane or as, as molecules that will travel and interact with other cells. The endoplasmic reticulum is a intercellular highway. Okay, an intercellular highway. It helps to work on proteins and complete proteins after the bound ribosomes have made it. And it serves as a membranous conduit from the nucleus out towards this, uh, the cell membrane. So instead of substances having to make their way all the way through the cytoplasm, they can take the endoplasmic reticulum superhighway as a fast track uh, to move in between those locations. Now, the endoplasmic reticulum is broken down into the rough ER, and we call it rough because it is covered with attached ribosomes. And the rough ER works on proteins and creates proteins that are going to be exported to the, from the cell or used in the cell's membrane. The smooth ER, which is a segment of the endoplasmic reticulum that there are not any ribosomes attached to, works on creating lipids and steroids it also helps to make uh, new segments of the plasma membrane when it needs to grow or be repaired and is also partly responsible for uh, calcium storage. So the rough ER, like we said, have attached ribosomes. Um, they are, it's responsible for making and modifying proteins and producing proteins that are exported from the cell. Now, the rough ER and the smooth ER and the ribosomes work hand in hand with the Golgi apparatus, which kind of finishes, sorts, labels, and ships proteins, like the UPS headquarters. It, um, on one side, here's the, the um, a picture of the Golgi apparatus, which is also called the Golgi body. Both things are mean the same thing. On one side, 
uh, called the cystes, there are transport vesicles or small blobs of membrane that break off from the smooth ER that carry proteins that were made in the endoplasmic reticulum into the Golgi apparatus. And as they work their way through towards the other side, which is called the transphase, they are modified and packaged. And then once they get to the transphase, they are put into vesicles or small packages of membrane to go out and to be released from the cell membrane. Lysosomes are also small little sacs of uh, phospholipid membrane that contain enzymes that break things down called hydrolytic enzymes. So they are responsible for digesting food particles, cleaning up and recycling, digesting broken organelles or pathogens. And uh, here you can see a picture of a lysosome digesting food from a food vacuole and digesting an organelle that is damaged and broken. So they're like the garbage disposals of the cell. A vesicle is just a bud of plasma membrane that is used to move stuff around. So here might be a vesicle that has a small food particle in it that is coming in and then being digested by a lysosome. So it moves material around in the cell and they're used for storage. A vacuole, on the other hand, is very similar to a vesicle, but they're much larger. For example, in plants, a plant has a very large central vacuole that helps plants remain rigid by letting in or or uh, pushing out water. They can be used to store chemicals and waste. In flowers, they contain pigments that could attract insect and pollinators, or they could contain poisons to protect the plants. Usually, if, the, if these vesicles are large enough to be called vacuoles, that'll generally be in plants. In animals and protists, though, you might still hear, hear the word vacuole, but really they're responsible for um, storing waste and water, like paramecia that live in, uh, in water are constantly pumping out water to maintain the water balance of the paramecia so it doesn't explode. So here's the central vacuole in a plant cell. Here are small vacuoles that pump out water in a paramecia that are called contractile vacuoles. In an animal cell, here's a vacuole storing food. Mitochondria are found in certain, in uh, well, most, sorry, eukaryotic cells, and their function is to make ATP energy through the process of cellular respiration we'll talk about in a few units, from um, biomolecules. And they have double membranes. Remember we talked about endosymbiosis? They have two membranes. And on the inside, the innermost membrane is folded, and it's folded to increase its surface area so it can be more efficient at producing energy. Now, I haven't read this statement in both animal and plant cells. It is a common student misconception I have encountered over the years that, okay, an animal cells only have mitochondria and plant cells only have chloroplasts. Well, it's true. Animal cells only have mitochondria. They don't have uh, uh, chloroplasts, but plant cells have both. They have both mitochondria and chloroplasts. So we should get that right from the very first time. Plants, like I said, make energy two ways. They can use mitochondria to, to break down organic molecules into ATP, but they also have these structures called chloroplasts, which harnesses sunlight energy and turns it into biomolecules through photosynthesis. And here, this green structure is a chloroplast. So chloroplasts are used to take the energy from sunlight and turn it into macromolecules. Here's a, another picture of some chloroplasts. 
in the cytoplasm. Now, cytoplasm is what we call the liquidy stuff inside the cell. So all of the organelles are bathed in this watery substance called cytoplasm. Now, you, now, we need to kind of be careful with this term because you will hear the term cytoplasm and cytosol. Cytoplasm is a term we use for everything inside of the cell. The fluidy gel substance and the organelles put together, where cytosol is simply the fluidy substance. So cytoplasm equals cytosol plus the organelles that are floating around in them. And cytosol is just this fluidy substance on its own. So here is an animal cell with some of the structures we talked about so far. And here's a plant cell that also has some of the uh, structures that we talked about so far. So the structures we've talked about so far are the main ones that you absolutely, 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 absolutely need to know cold for the AP exam and for class. Okay, not too many, but we absolutely need to know them. I know in seventh grade, you, you probably did a, a, a work on that. I know from some of my past students, you might have made t-shirts. Yeah, so shouldn't be that bad. Now, there's one other structure that I want to add, or two others, because they'll be important for class, but we don't need to know as much about them as we do the others. And one is the cytoskeleton, which is a long connect connected network of proteinous fibers that act as a skeleton or muscles that provide shape and structure for the cell and helps move organelles around the cell. And as you can say, they're, see, they're made up of membranous fibers. Now, I and the AP exam are not going to expect you to be able to, in detail, describe the differences between these fibers, but I'm including their names, especially so you can understand if you see in the literature that the, them being mentioned. Microtubules are part of this structure. They're hollow tubes that support and give shape to the cell. And they grow from structures we'll talk about in a second called centrioles in animal cells during the process of mitosis where cells are dividing. Intermediate fibers reinforce the shape of the shell. They're a little bit uh, bigger and they anchor the organelles in place so they don't just all float around uh, intermittently. So here's a picture of that stringy uh, uh, cytoskeleton network. Lastly, microfilaments, the smallest ones, aid in the cell's movement and support the cell shape inside of the cell membrane. So here's the smallest microtubules that you can see getting uh, pointed out right here. Now, the centrioles that we mentioned, where um, they, the microtubules grow from, help coordinate cell division, and they're only found in animal cells. Now, there's one pair in each cell that kind of look like this. That you might also call them, hear them called centrosomes. And they're where the what were called spindle fibers grow out of that help the chromosomes separate in uh, mitosis. And we're going to talk all about mitosis in the next unit. But I wanted to make sure to introduce this uh, structure, at least now, since we're talking about organelles in eukaryotes. Okay, so that's the end. You're going to probably need to refer back to this uh, presentation when you do our assignment, but we need to know these organelles, their jobs, their structures, and how they work together to achieve cellular functions.